Hello, uh, I'm Lisa Marganelli. I'm a senior research fellow with the New America Foundation, and I work on the Energy Policy Initiative. And uh, today I'm very happy to be able to talk with uh, Robert Ayers, who's a professor at INSEAD in France. Um, he's written a book called Crossing the Energy Divide, Moving from Fossil Fuel Dependence to a Clean Energy Future. And um, Robert has done, uh, has written 18 books in his career um, and has done some very interesting analysis on the role of energy and energy productivity in economies. But this analysis is very important right now for the sort of pickle that we're in. And if we could talk a little bit about that, we're in the midst of a recession um, that is both local and, and global. Um, we're facing uh, issues around climate change. Uh, that we have to deal with, and we're also facing resource constraints. Can you talk a little bit about the kind of triple whammy? Yeah. We have, of course, as you said, the current economic crisis, well, uh, last year's economic crisis, which I think isn't going to end anytime soon. Um, by the way, I believe there's a very good case to be made for the proposition that it was the rising price of oil in the summer of, first half of the summer of 2008, that kicked off the uh, real estate crisis. Simple argument when people were already having trouble paying their mortgages and suddenly they couldn't buy gas for their uh, SUVs. Absolutely, and it sort of worked as <laughs> it, a tumbling it, it bunch of trigger. dominoes. Yeah, yeah. And, and this this case is actually been made by a pretty well-known economist named James Hamilton at, uh, I think it's, University of California. Santa Barbara, Santa, maybe? No, it's San Diego. San Diego, okay. And uh, he, he presented that at Brookings uh, a few months ago. So. Right. And so, so that, that already brings in two elements. We have the, the financial crisis, which was really created by the banks, and we have what may have been the trigger, which was the rising oil prices. That, in turn, um, I would argue, and I think... I'm not alone, that um, we are beginning to approach the period of peak oil, that's what we call it, and um, there's plenty of evidence of that. There's also people who disagree, Exxon Mobil doesn't think there's any problem. Um, at least that's what they say well, for public a, well, consumption. Whether you believe that peak oil is, is upon us now or whether we're entering a zone of resource, resource constraints that will continue for years. Absolutely. We've got the research constraints are going to get tighter and tighter because the earth is finite, the number of people on it are, is growing, and we all count on economic growth. In fact, that we wouldn't have any pensions, we wouldn't be able to borrow money unless the banks could assume that there was going to be growth to pay the interest and so on. So growth is, is very much built into the whole economy. Um, Herman Daly uh, wrote a book about uh, a stationary economy, in fact, I also worked on that subject a few years ago, but it's extremely difficult to imagine how a stationary economy could work. If, in fact, growth is not expected, then how would you, on what basis would you be able to borrow? Mm -hmm. So a stationary economy borrow, is one that, that, that's... It almost certainly has to decline. Mm -hmm. uh, and this or, actually, or else we have to reinvent the whole economic model. And, that, that and this is brings us to the issue of climate change, because Absolutely. one of the big debates in climate change is can you constrain carbon emissions while continuing growth. Exactly so. Um, and, and uh, well, what this book is about is the proposition that we have to drastically reduce carbon emissions, well, emissions of greenhouse gases, not only carbon, but mostly carbon. That goes, that's one imperative. And indeed, the um, assumptions that were largely behind the 19, uh, sorry, 2007 um, IPCC report have been challenged in, in that it now looks as though they were too optimistic, maybe by quite a large amount. Mm -hmm. In other words, every trend is, is worse than we assumed it, or they assumed it would be. And, uh, I mean, the Arctic is melting faster. Right. Um, that's the most obvious. That's the easiest one to show to everybody. Right. 
but there are lots of others. Uh, oh, the melting, the um, damage to the to the coral reefs on, in all the oceans is another one that's easy to show. Mm -hmm. And so when when uh, skeptics, so-called, uh, say that well we had a cold winter, well I mean you have a cold winter in one place and you have a warm winter in another place. Remember that in the Olympics in Vancouver, it was exceptionally warm, mm -hmm. even though we had some snow in eastern U.S. Right. And in Europe, and but in, in the long term, there's, all, there's another issue to the climate change discussion, which is if Europe and Asia decide to, to enact carbon constraints, how can the U.S. compete it, unless we enact similar constraints? I mean, we can't, we, there, there are a lot of, there are other dimensions to the issue of whether or not the U.S. starts to address climate well, change. Uh, isn't it the other way around? Uh, it seems like the... Um, conservative side of the economics profession in the U.S. would prefer that they en enact constraints and we don't. Mm -hmm. Because that gives us an advantage. They, yeah, they, they would say that. Um, in fact, I think there's some, some truth in that argument, and that's what makes this whole issue very tricky. So because we have to cut the, cons cut the emissions, and yet we can't afford not to grow. Right. Now, how do we do both? Right. And that's what's so interesting about your book and your thinking on this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I, tell, I, it, I would tell add us your that prescription. We, that we can't drill our way out of it, even though there have been right. some recent and, discoveries. And we also can't windmill our way out of it, because we can, the windmills right. and, the, and the solar is not growing. We yeah. cannot grow fast enough. So let's get to the core of your argument about core of the argument. exergy and the importance oh. of okay. productive. Okay. Um, that's... That's the, um, <laughs> I've used Kasson's phrase, the elephant in the room, in a way, is that although standard economic theory assumes that growth can continue even if energy is not available, or regardless of the price of energy, they assume that growth is continuing 2%, 3% a year, and all the models assume it. Wherever you turn in this area of discussion, people are saying, oh, our grandchildren will be much richer than we are. And a great many of the policy prescriptions are predicated on that assumption. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the obvious implications of that assumption, which, by the way, I think is quite wrong, but the implication is that, as some conservatives say, it's almost criminal for us to invest in long-term amelioration of climate change when our grandchildren can do it so much more affordably or right. cheaper. Well, of course, they will make the same argument. You know, if, if growth is continuous, independent of, of energy availability, they can make the same argument uh, 50 years from now. Right. Why do it then? Because their grandchildren will be so much richer. Right. Okay, well, you may gather that I don't buy that argument. Tell us your argument. My argument is that when you go back and look at the Industrial Revolution and what happened since then, back in the 18th century, the economy of, the, of Europe or the United States was basically agrarian. It was agriculture. The wealth of nations really was based on its agricultural production. There were a few odds and ends and bits and pieces, but it was really agricultural production, and that's what the French physiocrats, really the first quantitative economists, said. Uh, and so out of that came an understanding, or really a more of a theoretical idea, that growth, economic growth, they didn't really think about growth back then, but that, that the economic activity depended on two main variables. One was labor, human labor availability. After all, at that time, the more farm workers you had, the more your production. And capital. Capital then was land, of course, and cows and horses and what, tools. And, and ultimately machines when you went into well, the industrial. Well, that's later, yeah. <laughs> right. Now we're at a time when the machines... If I could just back up, that would be why Marx was so interested in labor and capital. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Absolutely true. He, was, he, he took it all from the physiocrats. Mm -hmm. But capital has been redefined since then, uh, sort of bit by bit. Now it includes everything except labor. But it doesn't include energy. 
-hmm. Now, okay. If you think of capital as things, tools, structures, infrastructure, whatever, or even money, uh, without energy, it, it's inert. Mm -hmm. It can't do anything. People can't do anything without eating, without being fed. So both the human side of it and the capital side of it requires something else, and that something is energy. Now, you mentioned exergy. Um, energy, as we all know, well, well we don't, <laughs> physics <laughs> says, <laughs> And energy is a conserved quantity, so that there's the same amount every time, everywhere. Uh, it doesn't change, it can't be created or destroyed. However, energy in our normal understanding of the term is used up. Mm -hmm. Well, what the part that's used up is called exergy, technically. And so I will use that term because it's technically correct and also because it really makes the point that it's the part of energy that can do useful stuff, useful work that matters. Mm -hmm. And that part is not conserved. It can be used up. It is being used up. And that's, of course, what we mean when we say that resources are constrained and they're being used up. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't go, go away. I mean, the gold and the, <laughs> the platinum and the copper and so on that are mined and used and then discarded, not that we discard gold so much, but Right. Those metals that are discarded and go into waste dumps and so on, they're not disappearing into distant space. They're still on the earth. Right. But they're much less available. Talk about this in relationship to energy and the, cur well, the okay. current pickle. What I, that was all kind of background. <laughs> Point is that if you understand that capital and labor need to be fed, mm -hmm. they need fuel, and that nowadays the capital is mostly machines and structures that house the machines, and infrastructure, then it means that it, it, it follows that the growth of the economy should depend not just on the amount of capital and the amount of labor or the growth of the capital and labor supply, but also energy's got to be in there. Mm -hmm. Well, not just energy, but exergy. It's the part that's useful. Right. Okay. And so to skip over uh, a thousand pages of calculations and graphs and diagrams and so on, we can, working with others of course, uh, we can show that in fact economic growth in the United States over the past hundred years correlates very closely with the combination, I'm using the term production function, so we have a production function, which is a function that contains three variables, three independent variables, capital, labor, and exergy. Well, it actually, <laughs> I have to back up it slightly, because if I only use capital, labor, and exergy, I still can't, compl can't explain historical growth. When I include the useful work done by the exergy, then I can explain the historical mm -hmm. growth. The useful work is the product of the exergy input, mm -hmm. that's the raw stuff, times the efficiency with which it's converted into useful work. Right. So electricity is sort of pure useful work. Right. It's energy too, but it's pure useful work. It, you can convert it to, any, to heat, mm -hmm. you convert it to mechanical energy. Right. It's chemical very, it's energy. Fungible. It's fungible. Yes. fungible. Yes, that's the right word. I haven't used that word. That's a good word. Uh, it's fungible. So, uh, so our if economic you, growth if you do is it really tracked to a combination of labor capital, exergy, the available energy, and the efficient. and the, the way that it is, it, how efficiently it is converted That's into right. productive, productive, right. or production. That's right. And what we've done is to calculate. It, it's it can't be. It's not a very precise calculation because the, the government hasn't. Pr published statistics except on the on the electricity part of it but there are the other kinds of, of useful work such as the useful work done in automobile engine driving a car that's a useful work and it, we can calculate approximately the useful work done in the economy at any given time turns out um, again skipping a thousand pages <laughs> uh, turns out that the efficiency of the United States 
uh, which was around 4%, if I recall, in 1900, mm -hmm. has risen over the years to around 13% right. currently. 13%. And this compares to around 20% in Japan? Correct. And a theoretical... But we've done it also for two other countries, mm -hmm. Austria and the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. All three of them are up around 20%. The okay. United States lags behind at 13%, and if we could only get up to 20%, uh, we wouldn't be having any um, any scarcity problems right now. Right. We wouldn't need any imported oil. We'd be doing just fine. So this the so we have this sort of seven percent gap between yeah. us and other developed economies. Right. And that gap has a lot of implications for policy. Absolutely. One is is that if we could raise it, we could change our relationship to energy security. That's right. We could change our relationship to climate right. change. We could probably, if you track the idea that. We could get rid of a lot of poverty, too. Right. And if you track the idea that that is really related to productivity of the whole GDP of the economy, right. that 7% is this huge opportunity to kind of That's right. vault ahead. And it's, it's true on the one hand. I hate to be a two-handed economist here, yeah. but on the one <laughs> I have to be for a moment. On the one hand, it's true that the United States is different from Japan, Britain, Austria. Because we're big. Yeah. We're big and low density. Right. They're, they're compact and high density, and that density is a factor. Right. They use also much more public transportation. They use much more pub, uh, multifamily housing, which is better insulated and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Uh, on the other hand, this is the interesting beat, California is right on a par with those three countries. Mm -hmm. They started in California to do uh, important things about conserving energy 25 years, 20, 30 years ago. Right. And it's California which is way ahead of the rest of the United States right. in terms of energy efficiency. So why don't we all just try to be as efficient as California? And that, I think, is undoubtedly... I mean, a place that's known yeah. for its clogged freeways. Yes. Imagine that. Despite that. <laughs> yes. Despite that. Um, and, of course, it's also very clear that California can go a long way towards more public transportation and the, and the other things. But we can even get to California level. We've made a huge piece of, a huge gain. And I guess that would be one of the main lessons of this book, although right. we didn't discuss California especially. But the other is that, w that we can really put our fingers on a, a great many profitable opportunities to save energy. Right. Profitable. Right. And that saving energy can be an economic engine almost in itself. Exactly. And so among those opportunities are, for example, recycling industrial waste energy. Uh, right. So to give me just three other big ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> three other big ones. <laughs> I mean, the, the potential Look, in recycling waste energy is huge. We have the possibility of cutting uh, carbon emissions from electricity by as much as 50% at a profit. That's right. That's, that's right. There, there, as you said, I, I'm not going to uh, jump away from that for a moment because recycling industrial waste energy is the most glaring opportunity. And it's, it, we have all the technology. The opportunities are right out there in our face, so to speak. The only thing that's stopping it is, is regulations and the fact that the utilities are, are a, a regulated monopoly and they don't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, so anybody we have, who wants we to have get a in the combination of policies that prevent this from happening, that's one right. of them being the regulation of the utilities, one being the utilities' bias in favor of producing their own power instead of buying it, yeah. another one being Clean Air Act regulations, and, right. uh, and the, the fourth being how. Uh, industrial properties invest in themselves and how they make that dis those decisions. Right. Jumping away from that, as you said, okay, um, housing stock, uh, heating and cooling uh, the housing stock is actually as great a, a consumer of energy as industry. It's very inefficient. Uh, it really makes no sense to burn fossil fuels just to create heat, which is then used at a low temperature. That's really crazy. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do right. on a large state. So it would so be far more should, efficient to right. generate electricity in your house and use that heat to heat your water right. and your 
We Run call it combined cooler. heat and power. Right. And combined heat and power on a decentralized scale, not in, on necessarily on a very large scale. In fact, it's very difficult to apply the idea of using the waste heat if the power plant is 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that those plants be s small and local and, and, by the way, the economy, the supposed economies of scale, which justified allowing utilities to do what they do, that is to create these large plants and put them out there, those economies of scale are no longer around. Mm -hmm. We can produce energy as efficiently with a large diesel engine as with a huge uh, steam turbine. Actually, more, more efficiently more if efficient. you consider the, the, right. the distance to the And, the and there source. are other technologies available. Uh, another possibility, of course, is to use uh, much more of the solar energy that's available. Uh, rooftop PV, it's not so cheap right now. It will get a lot cheaper in time as the technology advances. Uh, what I uh, different is, areas, mm -hmm. transportation. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, and not so much in Japan, but in, in, in Northern Europe especially, there's a lot of use of bicycles. In Paris, where I live, uh, on the major boulevards now, the right-hand lane is reserved for buses, taxis, and bicycles. Mm -hmm. All other vehicles are in a traffic jam. into the center lane. Uh -huh. There are not, not many traffic jams, no, no worse than it was 30 years ago, actually. Maybe in some ways better because they, they're managing the traffic much mm -hmm. better and because fewer people bring their car. You don't need a car in Paris. Mm -hmm. Or in New York. You have the metro. But yeah. in L.A., you need a car. Right. Okay, so L.A. and cities in the United States, which are so car dependent, need to be seriously re... What's the word? Rethinking. Uh, rethought and somehow regenerated. Right. Well, there are many one, other opportunities. I mean, I was coming down Connecticut Avenue mm -hmm. this morning, and I, I, it was quite clear that they, you could do the, exactly the same thing reserve the right-hand lane for buses, bicycles, and taxis. Mm -hmm. They would have moved very fast, mm -hmm. including the bicycles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, everybody else would move a little slower. But then that would m induce those other people to switch. Mm -hmm. More of them would switch. And that's what we need to do. We need to, to um, induce people to use public transport, the bus, or the metro. Mm -hmm. And to allow them also to use the bicycle. Right. Or to carpool or bicycle. Or carpool, or all those any, things. All these wonderful yeah, things. Yeah, well. So, but to, to get back, what I think is so interesting is that you've identified this sort of cognitive gap in our thinking about energy and the economy and the powerful role of the productive use of energy in the economy, which implies um, a real importance around the price of energy. Oh, yeah. And, and the implications of that for our current predicament are pretty huge. It means that what we really need to do, we have enormous opportunities in energy efficiency, and we need to somehow get over both the cognitive and financial and physical barriers towards exercising that. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about those barriers? The barriers? Well, I'm sort of literal-minded, I guess, so I, I'm not so much into cognitive barriers, but <laughs> I guess there's one very important one. Um, which is seldom considered. And that if, if, if you ask the question, why don't companies invest in energy saving technologies which are going to be profitable? And there's a lot of evidence mm -hmm. that there are profitable technology opportunities and that they don't invest in them. Mm -hmm. If you ask them why, and, and there have been a number of questionnaires, quite a few surveys, they'll mention all sorts of things, uh, notably, of course, capital scarcity. Mm -hmm. But then those same companies are investing capital in other places. And the real cognitive gap here is that the companies are not profit maximizing as economic theory suggests. They're not. What they're trying to do almost inevitably is to maximize their growth opportunities. And the reason for that seems to be, and I'm, maybe I'm out of my field here, but I think the reason is that they see growth as, as uh, the safety, the protection against being swallowed up. Right. It's, it's survival. Right. And um, So it and makes sense. It may not make sense to an economist, but it makes sense to, to everybody else. Yeah. 
<laughs> and, and actually, I think one of the things companies will, will articulate that in a slightly different way. They'll say during uh, a high business cycle, you invest in more production. And during a low business cycle, you do not invest in conserving energy. You cut costs. So you just cut costs, and yeah. you just kind of hunker down. Yeah. And so there is no time in the cycle when you would pour money into um, into right. energy efficiency, unless, of course, you were Dow Chemical, which is if saving you, yeah, billions so of dollars a year. Dow, I think it was Dow yesterday, um, made the point that in times like that, uh, they may uh, divide all the opportunities into two classes: those that have a cost attached, and those that don't. Right. Those there that are, make money. Yeah. yeah, there are things that can be done at no cost, which save energy, and they'll do those things, mm -hmm. <laughs> and only those <laughs> things. If there's a cost, e even though there are many opportunities that will pay for themselves in months, not not mm -hmm. necessarily five years, but in months. Right. Even those opportunities are ignored at, in, in times of recession, and in times of expansion, they want to spend their money on expansion. And that really is, I would say, the single biggest factor in, in the situation that we face. And I think one of the things your, some of your research showed was that there's, um, I don't know how big the opportunity is for energy efficiency in dollars. It's, it's, is it conceivably a trillion dollars or so in the U.S.? I mean, it's, it's quite well, enormous. Over what over, period? Over, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, Give there, us a, there are a number of different studies that have come up with numbers in the hundreds of billions uh, and maybe up to a trillion, but they're usually spread over some time. Right. And so I can't give you a simple answer to right. that. But so, uh, uh, so, I mean, I guess the question is, we come back to the, the, the final question is the joke about the economist and his... And his <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tell us the joke. Well, um, as I heard it first, uh, there's an elderly gent who was walking on the street with his grandson. He's a boy, I don't know why. And the boy uh, sees a, uh, a bill uh, on, the, on, on the sidewalk. He picks it up, and it's a $100 bill. And his grandfather says, no, son, that one has to be, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> that one doesn't exist. What's the word for uh, fraudulent? Oh, it has to be a fake. Fake, yeah. yeah. But there's a word, and I can't think. <laughs> a forgery. I'm an elderly moment. What's what's the <laughs> what's the word for fake money? <laughs> a forgery. Forgery, yes. yes. That has to be a forgery. Why? Why does it have to? Because if that were real, someone would have picked it up already. Right. And what we have here is this situation with energy efficiency, where we have billions of of yeah. bills on the ground, and we, da we can't yet acknowledge that they're real we and what they might do. Well, at least mainstream economists, I'm remembering a little confrontation I had with one of the senior professors at Harvard in the economics department, who simply told me flatly, these opportunities don't exist. The theory says they don't exist. Mm -hmm. Well. So the obvious implication is we need to change the theory. Uh, I think so. To, yes. to, to, uh, to get at what exists. It's time to stop <laughs> letting the theory trump the reality. Okay. Uh, let the, let the, the, the theory really needs to be reconsidered. Okay. Well, on that, let's finish. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. The book, uh, the, I've been talking with Robert Ayers. Uh, the book is Crossing the Energy Divide. Um, it's published by Wharton School Publishing. I imagine you can find it on Amazon or on Powell's. Oh, yeah. um, but it's certainly worth your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.